All right, you can be seated. We have come to question 87 in our catechism. We'll do some of the other questions first, though. We're looking at what we as sinners must do to be saved, really. This whole section of the catechism from question 85 to the end answers that question. What must I do to be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asks. It's an important subject. We have seen that every person needs to be saved because we are all sinners. And because we are sinners, we are under God's wrath and curse. And so we need His salvation. Question 85 is the question in our catechism that we looked at a couple of weeks ago that introduces us to this last part of the catechism. And uh, it, it teaches us what we must do to be saved in a summary way. So let's review this question by confessing it together. Question 85. What doth God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requireth of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, with the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption. Now, having looked at this general introduction to the topic two weeks ago, we turned last week to look at faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing that's mentioned. What does he require? Faith in Jesus Christ. So let's confess the answer to that question together. Question 86, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel. We looked at how faith in Jesus is a reliance upon him and his saving work. As the son of God, he came into the world to save sinners. He lived a perfect life of obedience as a rep our representative and then he went to the cross to atone for our sins, to pay the penalty of our sin, and to secure our pardon. Even though we are sinners, we are accepted as righteous in God's sight if we, as it says, receive and rest upon him alone for salvation. That's how we are um, made righteous. So instead of relying on our own deeds or things that we have done, then we totally rely on what he has done. But the Catechism mentions two other things that are required of us if we are to escape God's wrath and curse. There is repentance unto life, and there is the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. So sometimes it is confusing to Christians to sort out how we on the one hand are told to receive and rest upon Christ alone, but then on the other hand, we're told that we must repent and use the outward means if we wish to be saved. So which is it? You know, I'm going to try to explain this to you as we look at the requirement of repentance today, repentance unto life, which is the subject of our question today, question number 87. So what is this question, question 87, what is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. Notice that this is not speaking about any repentance, any old repentance. This is speaking about repentance unto life. So it's a kind that brings eternal life to us, a kind of repentance that brings eternal life to those who were once dead in their trespasses and sins. For our scripture readings today, I have selected Romans 6, which we read earlier, and also Ezekiel 18, which I want to read to you now, which is very much of a parallel to Romans 6. 
So listen carefully as I read this to you. This is from the Word of God. Ezekiel 18, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, if he has not extracted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. So let's just say here for a moment, pause here for a moment. So when we're speaking about a man like this, you know, you can say, oh, that almost sounds like work salvation. We're going to talk about this later. But I just want to mention here, now, this is talking about what we could call big repentance. It's talking about repentance and apostasy. So it's talking about that we either are estranged from God, we're against God, or we're turned to God and we've come, we've come to Him to live unto Him. We either live against God or we live for God. Those are the only two ways. And so when we live for God, then we come resting in Christ and we go on in the way of the Lord. If we're against God, then we reject Christ and we reject God's ways. So these are people, when they turn, you see they're turning in conversion, coming to him, or they're turning away, they're going into apostasy. There were people that once professed and then they turn away from the Lord. So let's go on then and read. We, we read about ones that turn away as well as ones that turn to. So verse 10 says, if he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does none of those duties, but has eaten on the mountains or defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and needy, robbed by violence, not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to the idols or committed abomination, if he has extracted usury or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, who has withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received usury or increase, but has executed my judgments and walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. Let me just pause there for a minute too and make a couple of other comments. There's some things here you might wonder what they're talking about, like what does it mean, what's wrong with eating on a mountain? You know, what's, what is that talking about? It's talking about going to a place where there are idol shrines and they would go to, um, to the mountains, you know, to, to eat and, and have an idol feast. So that's what it's talking about, worshiping idols. And then when it talks about um, that he has withdrawn his hand from the poor, that could sound like that he decided he wasn't going to help the poor out. <laughs> you know, he was helping the poor, and then he said, oh, I'm going to abandon that guy. I'm going to leave him alone. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about when you, like, lend, lend money to the poor, and then you ride on him to get, to get your, your, your money back, you know, that you've, you've loaned to him, and you, you, you won't leave him alone, and you take his, he's given you a pledge, and you hang on to the pledge, and you won't give it back to him. That's, that's what it's talking about there. So these are just, again, this is how God's people live or don't live, right? It's, it's, it's saying we either live as God's people or we live as not God's people. 
So he's, um, he's done things, uh, all, all kinds of different things that are characteristic of the ungodly. Then uh, in verse 18, it goes on to talk about now his father. It says, as for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. So the son is, uh, has repented. He's not continued in his father's sin. Verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel. It is not my way which is, is it not my way which is fair in your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. And there we end the reading of God's holy word. May he bless the reading and now the preaching of his word. In the catechism and in the passages that we read today, we see the essential action of repentance. What is the essential action of repentance? The essential action of repentance is turning from sin to God. It's very simple. That's what it is when you boil it down. It's turning from him as, it is turning to him as our God, as our Lord and master whom we obey and serve. So we turn from our own way to God's way. Let's look at, the, at this first in the definition of repentance that the catechism gives us. If you boil it all down, the subject in the answer is a sinner. And the question is that, or, or the action that he takes is that he turns from his sin unto God. So a sinner turns from his sin to God. That's the essence of repentance. This is the reversal of what happened in the fall when a godly man, Adam, a godly man before he fell, turned from God to sin. It, it, it's a very personal thing between a sinner and God, and it's not just to turn from sin to obedience, though it is that, but it's actually turning back to God himself as our God. We're coming to God when we repent. In the fall, we rejected God as our God, and by eating the forbidden fruit, declared that instead of obeying God, that we would follow our own desires now. 
We would do what we, our will instead of God's will if, it, if they conflicted with each other. I showed you how coming short of what God requires of us is something that Adam was actually incapable of doing until he severed his relationship with God by eating the, the forbidden fruit. In other words, when Adam was just in the garden, he was, he was devoted to God. He couldn't, we come short of the glory of God just sort of without even trying to, just as we are going along. But for Adam, he had to deliberately say, okay, I'm going to be in charge here and do what I want instead of doing what God says. Took that action, that declaration was made by eating the fruit. So he turned from God to sin, away from God. And we need to turn back to God. That's what repentance is. The native relationship of the human being with God before the fall is one in which the human lives in perfect harmony with the will of God like Jesus Christ did. But now after the fall, our default position is that whenever our desires are contrary to God's will, we follow our own desires. At its core, repentance is turning back to God and presenting ourselves as servants to obey Him. We come back to Him as our God turning from our sin to obey his will from now on. Romans 6 describes turning from sin to God as being true of all those who have come to Christ to be justified. Paul shows that repentance is an integral part, an inseparable aspect of coming to Christ for salvation that is never missing. In other words, no one comes to Christ for salvation without turning from sin to God. You, you don't come for salvation unless you turn to God. Some who had heard Paul's teaching in the previous chapters to Romans 6, his teaching about justification being by faith in Christ alone, objected that if this be true, then why not go on living in sin, they said. If it magnifies the grace of God to save us apart from our works, then why not sin all the more? so that God will be magnified all the more. If the more sin abounds, the more grace abounds, hey, we can glorify God more. If we do a whole lot of sin, we multiply our sin and increase our sin, God will be all the more glorified if He keeps on pardoning us, if it's just by faith and it's not by, by anything that we do. So they say, what, Paul, what are you teaching here? Like, so you, you're telling us this? And, and Paul responds that the notion is absurd, <laughs> that it's idiotic. In, in, in Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we just sin more and more so that grace will be more and more? He says, certainly not. Of course not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you see what he's getting at here? He's saying that the very act of coming to Christ involves in itself Coming to Christ involves, the action of coming to Him involves dying to self and living unto God, turning to God. He says, how can someone who died still live in their, their, old, their old way that they died to? He, he shows in verses 3 and 4, the whole process of coming to Christ to be cleansed was so that we could die to sin and be raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism represents that. We come to be washed from the old way, from the old life, to be raised out of that old way, which was death, and to be brought, raised with Christ to live. We die to the old and we're raised to the new. Paul goes on to speak of repentance as presenting ourselves to God to be his servants. Repentance is a conscious, deliberate turning from sin to serve Him as our God, turning from our sin to live in obedience to Him as our Lord and Master. You can see this, for example, in verse 16, Romans 6, 16, where he says, Do you not know that to whom you present your mem yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Do you see the point here? Our whole intention in coming to Christ, our deliberate conscious attention, intention is to serve God. 
That's why we come, to be reconciled to God. Christ is offered for our justification, not so we can keep on living in rebellion against God and not get punished for it. He is offered for our justification so that we might come back to God and live for Him, that we should walk in newness of life. You haven't come to Christ for salvation if you haven't died to the old and come to live in the new. When we come, we repent. We present ourselves as slaves to Him, as those who have come to obey Him, to belong to Him and to love Him. If you did not come to be restored to God that you might live in harmony with Him, then for what reason did you come? Why did you come to Him at all? If you don't want to live with God, if you don't want to be restored to Him, why did you come to Him? We, we come to Christ that we may be restored and to God. Then there is Ezekiel 18. It shows us the same thing. In the first part of the passage, the Lord addresses the complaint of those who were born in the exile that it was our fathers that sinned. You know, he objects to their, their little complaining proverb that they've come up with in verse 2, that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. They're complaining that, you know, we didn't do all this stuff like idols and the worshiping on the mountains and all those things that our fathers did. And now here we are in exile. We we're born here. We didn't do anything to deserve this. Why are we here? They're, they were complaining about that. Their fathers sinned and now they're bearing the punishment. They're the ones that were born in the land of exile. And it's true, isn't it? They, they, hadn't, they weren't alive. They didn't do that. And they were born in the exile. So what, 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 what are we saying here? Well, these complainers, what was wrong with them? They didn't have an eternal perspective. They were just looking at the things in front of their face right now. You see, the Lord tells them that whoever serves him will live. What's he talking about? obviously eternal life he's talking about eternal life because he says the other one who doesn't serve him will die in their sin they will die in their sins so he's talking about judgment eternal judgment with very practical terms he speaks first to the one who serves him 18 5 through 9 and shall live and then of his son who does not serve him and dies in sin 18, 10 through 13. And then of the wicked man's son, 18, 14, who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers and does not do likewise and declares in verse 17 that what? He shall live. He's talking about eternal life and eternal death, isn't he? It's not like the guy that went into his sin died, right? When he went into his sin, there was the wicked father that had the son. And the son was brought up, and then the son came to his senses. It's not like he's saying, as soon as he turned away, he died. No, he's talking about the eternal consequences. So they're looking and saying, oh, we were born in exile. So, I mean, yeah, it's not pleasant to be in exile, but you can still know God. It doesn't keep you from coming to God and having eternal life. You might not be in the land of promise, but you can still come to God. The contrast then is between those who, as Romans 6 describes, present themselves as servants to God to obey Him, and those who don't do that. Those who repent of their sin to serve God, and those who do not repent of their sin to serve God. Turning from one's sin to serve God is referred to as repentance in verses 21 through 24. The one who repents is the one who has eternal life, and the other one does not. Look at what it says, Ezekiel 18, 21. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed, see there's forgiveness, none of the transgressions which he committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all in that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? There is forgiveness with God. When we repent, God accepts our repentance. But if we do not, if we do not repent, verse 24 shows that we will perish in our sin even if we have served God in the past. You say, oh, I did a bunch of good things when I was younger. I did a bunch of things before. 
doesn't matter. He says, but when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them, he shall die. So you see, Ezekiel is talking about repentance unto life, to eternal life. He is showing us that repentance is absolutely necessary for those who do not wish to die in their sins. If we do not repent, we die in our sins. If we do repent, then we have life. We have eternal life. But how does this agree? I told you I would get to this with the doctrine that justification is by faith alone. Some modern evangelicals reject the teachings of the Reformed confessions and of the scriptures about the necessity of repentance. They want to take repentance out and say, no, it's just free grace. You just only believe. We say only believe too, faith alone. But why do they want to take out repentance? Well, theirs is an overreaction against both liberalism and Roman Catholicism, but it is an overreaction. It's a wrong reaction. It's not a reaction that's found in the Reformed confessions, which are based upon the scriptures. The reaction against the idiotic notion that sinners can be accepted on the basis of their own merit for the liberal theologian on the basis of their own intrinsic goodness, they say, well, people are good inside, so God will accept everyone. And the Roman Catholic, on the basis of Christ plus their own works, in reacting against these gross errors, you see, these evangelicals deny that repentance is required of those who wish to escape God's wrath and curse. So, oh, no, you don't have to repent. It's just free grace. Sadly, because this reaction is clearly erroneous, then it opens the door to the acceptance of the very theologies it's trying to oppose. If you overreact to something, then a lot of times people will go back to the thing because they see that something is missing in your overreaction, and then they'll turn back to the thing that you're trying to deliver them from. So because these evangelicals fail to explain the proper biblical place of repentance, because it's clear from Scripture that repentance is necessary, Jesus said, repent or you will likewise perish. John the Baptist said, repent. You know, Paul said he preached repentance wherever he went. He preached uh, faith toward God and repentance toward our Lord Jesus, or faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ and repentance toward God. Because it's clear from Scripture then that repentance is necessary, it opens the way for people to accept the false place that liberal theology gives to a kind of repentance, that people are good, or that Romanism gives to it. It's very appealing to our sinful selves to think that we can be saved on the basis of our own goodness and merit as well. That's why we must be very careful to set forth what the Bible actually teaches about repentance. So that by looking to the scriptures, those who belong to Christ can see the truth according to God's word. That's where we have comfort from the scriptures when what we're saying is in agreement with the word of God. So the truth is that repentance is not in competition with receiving and resting upon Christ alone for salvation. Repentance and faith are not in competition with each other because they're not doing the same thing. According to the scriptures, justification comes only by Christ's righteousness. Saving faith entirely rests upon him and him alone for righteousness and not upon anything else. First, we depend on his obedience instead of our own obedience. We trust in him. We rest in him. Only he is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Only he has the life that is acceptable to God. Only he brought that life into this world. Second, we depend on his satisfaction for sin on the cross and not on works of righteousness which we have done, tears that we have shed, experiences that we have had, ceremonies that we have observed, inner goodness, or anything of the kind does not atone for our sin. 
can cry rivers of tears for your sin, but that doesn't atone for a single one. Justification is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Repentance, on the other hand, is not, according to Scripture, trying to do the same thing that saving faith is trying to do. When I repent, I am simply coming to God. I'm turning from sin to God. I am not supposing that by turning to Him, I am now living such a good life that God can now declare that I'm justified by that life, that I earn acceptance with Him because of the merits of that good life. If that's what I was looking at, if I said, oh, my repentance is good enough for God to accept me or to, to forgive me or whatever, then I would be trying to make repentance do the same thing that faith does. That's what Paul utterly refutes in Romans 3, 4, and 5. That's what led to the question, in fact, in Romans 6, that if we are accepted or justified on the basis of Christ's righteousness and that alone, then why not sin that grace may abound? Do more sin, and then there's more grace. Repentance is not looking to gain acceptance with God by supposing that my service to God is is able to justify me, repentance is simply me turning from sin and coming to God as my God. To illustrate, think of a sinner who is coming to God for salvation as a woman who lives in a wicked kingdom. She sees that there is a righteous kingdom and she wants to live in that kingdom, but she has an insurmountable problem. She, being of the wicked kingdom, is not righteous in the eyes of the other kingdom. She has two problems. She's guilty, and her character is also flawed. To enter that kingdom, she must both satisfy her for her guilt and present to the king a character that is not flawed. There is nothing she can do. She can't do that. But then she discovers that the righteous kingdom has a prince who is willing to marry her. Not only will she be accepted on the basis of his good standing in the kingdom, but he is also willing to pay her entire debt. She will not need to rely on her own imperfect character, nor will she need to come up with a payment for her debt. She can entirely leave that to her betrothed husband. He will take care of all of that. She can entirely put her faith in her husband. But it goes without saying, doesn't it, that she must leave her old kingdom and relocate into the new kingdom if she is to come and live in that kingdom. She can't live in that kingdom no matter what. Her husband can do everything. He can pay the debt. He can, he can have the right standing and everything. But if she doesn't move from the old kingdom into the new kingdom, then she's not living in that kingdom. That's what repentance is. It's a relocation. I was living in rebellion against God in that kingdom. And when I repent, I come to live for God in his kingdom. I don't get, it's not the merit of my coming that justifies me. It's just simply my coming brings me from where I was into the new kingdom to live here. I was living there, I come to live here. All of the merit for my justification, for my forgiveness, for my right standing with God is based on faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not repentance, faith in Jesus Christ alone. You see the point, as a sinner then, you are not justified on account of your repentance, as if somehow you satisfied what God requires. Jesus is the one who satisfies what God requires, and we receive that benefit by faith. But if you do not turn from your sin and come to serve God through him, that is, if you do not repent, you will die in your sins. You must repent and come to God if you wish to escape God's wrath and curse then. This is what Ezekiel 18 is talking about, and this is what Romans 6 is talking about. How can I say that I have been saved if I'm still living in rebellion against God in the kingdom of rebellion. I haven't been rescued from there. I have to come here. All the merit is based on what he did. 
You're repenting in order that you may live. Do you see how this fits in with James 2.20, which says faith without works is dead? If you have some kind of faith that is in Jesus, but it's not a faith that brings you into God's service, what good is that faith? It didn't bring you to God. What were you looking for? Just forgiveness? Well, I guess everybody wants to escape punishment. It's a faith that cannot save you from the wrath and curse of God. That was actually what I had for about 20 years or, or something. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that long but um, because it didn't, I didn't have the faith part. But I tried to have that kind of faith that James was talking about that is not a real faith. Because I was, I was in a liberal church that I grew up in. And I heard the gospel when I was in junior high school or so that by trusting in Jesus Christ, you have your sins forgiven. I thought, oh, that's good. Yeah, I, well, I'm a Christian. I guess I trust in Jesus Christ. So, yeah, and I would tell people, you know, I learned from that, people that were actually preaching the gospel, I learned to tell people, you know, you, they say, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Oh, yeah, because I trust in Jesus. That's the only way you can go to heaven. That was true, wasn't it? I, I was right. But I didn't repent. I was still living, I was glad, hey, yeah, I'm going to heaven because I trust in Jesus. But I I had not come to God, I wasn't reconciled to God. And it was when I was about 20 years old that I started reading the scripture and came to a Bible study and and then I learned that, oh wow, you know, I need to turn from my sin to God. And I didn't do that, I still understood and believed that I was not justified by that, it was by trusting in Jesus. But now I had to go from the kingdom of darkness and come to the kingdom of righteousness. I wasn't really trusting in him in a saving way because I didn't see what, the, what it was all about. I just, I just wanted, it was like a fire insurance policy that, oh good, I won't, I won't have to go to hell now and be punished in the flame, flame of fire. Now since we have seen that repentance is essential to salvation, then it behooves us to consider what true repentance is. You need to be sure that you have real repentance. There is a kind of repentance unto sorrow that is not repentance unto life. Okay, so you can have a false kind of repentance too. So let's consider now as our third heading, the nature of repentance unto life. What does repentance unto life look like? Now remember, what is the chief act of repentance? Very simple. Turning from sin to God is our God. That's the chief act of repentance. So when this turning to God is real, then there must be what the catechism says, a true sense of sin. You see how that's stated in the catechism. God's spirit convicts you so that you recognize what sin is. Sin is not just our survival instincts that we developed over the years to protect ourselves and to from other people and so now it's sin because we're being selfish or or something like that or somebody was telling me that a few years ago nor is it mere natural human weakness that keeps you from being all that you could be you know we're just we just have natural human weakness no no the holy spirit shows you that sin is rebellion it is defiance against the most high god That's what we all participate in, in Adam. You are severed from a right relationship with him as your God because of rebellion against him. It is a most egregious thing. It's not just a natural thing. It's a most unnatural and wicked tearing away of ourselves from union with our very own creator and maker. It's those who are created to have union with him and to do his will in all things. Those who are privilege to be created to be a reflection of his beauty and his goodness of his righteousness and truth and wisdom his holiness his perfection those who would love one another as he loves from all eternity we 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 rebelled against him and all that he is with repentance then you see that this is a very grievous thing that i have done this is this is a, sin is a, 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 a very heinous thing. And you turn from it to God, to come back to God, to, to say, I'm not going to live. I don't want to continue to live in rebellion against God. 
You have to have a sense not only of how filthy and odious it is, but also of the terrible guilt that it incurs. We deserve to be punished with the punishment that God has pronounced against the devil and his angels. He has pronounced it against us and we deserve it. His eternal wrath and judgment, that's what is just punishment. God has said so. As we saw in Ezekiel 18, the sinful soul will die in his sin. He will go to his grave under condemnation. Eternal misery is our due. As Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. And we come, when we have a sense of our sin, we come to see that sin is that bad. Now, we may struggle somewhat with seeing it as as all that, you know, as fully that bad, but we see it as something that is very heinous that we believe does deserve eternal punishment and we want to turn away from it to God. That's what repentance is. So that's the first thing. A sense, a true sense of sin. First characteristic of true repentance. Secondly, true repentance involves an apprehension of God's mercy in Christ. Now, that's how it's stated in the catechism. What does it mean by apprehension? It means that you understand, you comprehend, you grasp something of God's mercy if you're going to repent. If you don't see that God is merciful, you would never repent. You know, if you did not know that there was forgiveness with God, you would not be able to really face your sin as it is and to turn from it. It would be too much to bear. And why would you? You would want to avoid God rather than trying to turn to God. The last thing you'd want to do is come to God if you were, there was no forgiveness and you were condemned. You'd want to hide under the rocks. You know, the prophets speak about that, that the ungodly that have not repented, that die in their sins... When the day of judgment comes, they'll want the mountains to fall and cover them up. They don't want to be before God. They'd rather have a big mountain drop on their head. But oh, what a change there is when God's spirit opens your heart and you see that God freely offers complete pardon through his son. You see how Christ came and died on the cross to make complete satisfaction for sin. You see how complete forgiveness is promised to all who will trust in him. And seeing that, you turn from your sin that you might get to Christ. Oh, I want this. I want to come and I want to be forgiven. You flee from the wrath to come in order you come to him. You come to God with joy. You know how glad those those poor souls in Acts chapter 2 when when they realized they saw the heinousness of their sin that they had crucified the Lord of glory and they said, men and brethren, what can we do? And Peter told them that there was mercy with God. He said, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And they were so glad that there was mercy with God. They apprehended the mercy of God in Christ and they came to God. They turned from their sin to God. The Lord graciously set this, his mercy forth in Ezekiel as well. He shows not only that he is willing to pardon the sinful soul that turns to him, but he is actually pleased and eager to do so. God's mercy isn't just a mercy that he's like, well, maybe I'll do that. He's eager to show, to extend mercy to all who will come to him. Remember verses 21 and 23, which we read? If a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Okay, he turns from his own way and comes to my way. He says, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. God says, listen how merciful God is. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live, not that he should repent and live. Isn't that wonderful to hear? If we return to him, he will forget all the wrong that we have done. And he will accept us through Jesus Christ. He will take care of our sin and we will be able to serve him forever. We will be able to live. That is the mercy of God in Christ that everyone who repents, apprehends, understands, 
considers. When repentance, the third thing, when repentance is real, there will also be grief and hatred of his of our sin. How can there not be when the Holy Spirit gives us a true sense of it? How egregious it is uh, and, and of the punishment that's due to it, to it. When he shows us how God's son had to suffer on account of it, the misery that it brought upon him, how can we not be grieved for and hate our sin? Ezekiel frequently speaks about this in his prophecies. For example, in Ezekiel 36, 21, he says that when the Spirit of God has come, given us a new heart and all that, changed our lives, he says, and brought us to God, granted us repentance, he says, then you will remember, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will what? Loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. That's when we really repent, isn't it? When we loathe ourselves and we say, I can't live like this anymore. I've got to go to God. This is, my behavior is obnoxious. It is offensive. You know, that's what I was talking about today, that sometimes even as we grow in our Christian life, we come to a place of new repentance where we just something we were doing for a long time. We just kind of like, maybe it was the anger thing or something like that. And we were, we were that way all the time we get angry and be like oh yeah i shouldn't have done that and, but we didn't we, we didn't really repent not, not really and then you come to a place where like, this is unacceptable this is not i can't go on living like this it is heinous it's odious you you turn away from it and and come to god well this is what we do overall as a whole person as a sinner when we come to God, we turn from our sin and say, I can't live this way in rebellion against God, and we come to Him. Now, we'll have other times when, what I was talking about, we grow further as we go along. But there's a, a turning of the whole sinner from, uh, from his sin to God. We, we, we are ashamed of, of what we have done. In Romans 6, 21, Paul speaks of how unfruitful we were without Christ. And how when we repent, that we're ashamed of those things that we did, the things for which we are now ashamed. If the truth be told, we too often look with longing on our old sins. But when God grants us true repentance, we're able to look at them with grief and hatred and turn from them unto God. And that turning to God, that repentance, if it is real, fourth characteristic it will be with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. We come to God, in other words, with a desire to please Him, to do His will, to serve Him. That's our purpose in coming to Him. That's what Paul speaks about over and over in Romans 6. In verses 11 through 14, he says that we should, just, we should consider ourselves dead to sin. He says, likewise, you also... Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to, it, to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So you're, you're dead to that old way. That's not where you live anymore. You left that kingdom to come into God's kingdom. That's what you do when God grants you true repentance. You present yourself to serve in the new kingdom. Why does he say your members, by the way? I don't know if you remember me talking about that before. He's saying that because... It's not just in your head or something like that or in your inner person, but you come to actually live in a manifestly different way. You used to be involved in, in fornication and strife and, and cursing people and um, all, all kinds of different rebellion, telling, telling lies. And, and you take your body, your members, to come and render them to, into service to Christ. You turn from sin to serve Him. You're eager then, you present yourself to God to serve Him as your God. You're eager to learn His ways, to live in conformity to His ways, 
to please him in everything that you do. You want to put off the old man, as it says, and to put on the new man that is renewed in righteousness and holiness after the image of him who created us. So you see what a splendid thing repentance is. Faith in Christ is splendid because it makes us acceptable to God. Faith in Christ makes us acceptable to God. And repentance is splendid because it brings us from sin to God to serve him as one of his people. Serving God is what life is meant to be. It is what living is all about. We were dead in our sins. We repented and came to live in Jesus Christ, to live unto God. And there is one last thing that I need to add. All the glory for your repentance must go to God. As we saw with faith, repentance also is said to be a saving grace. Calling it a saving grace means that it is a grace that comes from God. It is a work that he does when he comes to save us as an individual. A grace is something that he works in us. It's something that we do not have in ourselves and that we cannot ourselves produce. In this case, something that we do, we repent when he transforms us. So it's a saving grace that comes about by his transforming work. Perhaps you remember what I said last week about how faith is a saving grace. We looked at Ephesians chapter 2 where it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. In other words, you would never receive Christ if God did not open your heart and give you faith. You would just keep on rebelling in, in, in unbelief. You would be too proud and too rebellious to believe unless God changes you. Well, the same is true of repentance. Until God's Spirit powerfully works in us, then we won't receive the things of God. We don't want to leave our sin and come to God to serve Him. We have no interest in that. We must be born again. We must be born from above. We must be born of God's Spirit. Or we'll never even want to come to the kingdom of God to serve Him. We want to go on in the darkness and rebellion and strife and malice and discord and all those things. We might want to escape punishment, but we don't want to come to God. God changing us so that we will repent and desire to please Him is so much a part of His grace toward us that it's one of the two key promises of the new covenant. He has two major promises of the new covenant, and one of them is the promise of repentance unto life. In Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, the Holy Spirit's promise in Jeremiah is quoted. It says in Hebrews 10, 16 to 17, one of those two examples, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds I will write them. Then he adds their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. So second part, then he adds the sins and lawless deeds. That's the forgiveness. But you see that he puts writing his law in our hearts right alongside of the forgiveness of sins. This is the promised work of the Holy Spirit to put into our hearts a desire to serve and obey God. This is what Titus calls the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is the new birth. This is what is represented by the washing of baptism, which points to how Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. At the door of his kingdom, he meets us with baptism and says, you must be washed to come into my house, right? We would never repent of our sins and come to serve God apart from this powerful, transforming work of the Holy Spirit. The new birth is what God does. Repentance is what we do. You understand that? Like God changes our heart and then we turn from sin to serve God because we've, our, our heart's been changed. Glory be to God. It's His grace that we repent. 
So question, has God done this work in you? Examine yourself as whether the Spirit of God is in you. Do you delight in the law of God in your soul? Do you or not? Do you desire to please the Lord and to do His will? Do you live for God? If you don't, you have not really repented unto life. If you do not, there could be several reasons for it. Perhaps you have sin in your life that you need to deal with. Bitterness, lust, things that you've been indulging, sins against others that you won't deal with, what we were talking about this morning. Or maybe you've been slacking your prayers and then seeking God in His Word and you're, you're all dried up in your walk with Him. That can happen too. But perhaps, perhaps it's that you were like I was when I was 20 years old and that you've never truly repented of your sins. Maybe you only came to God to be forgiven, but never repented of your sins, never actually have yet presented yourself to God as his servant to obey him. Or maybe you only repented in a superficial way to please the people that were around you. God has given you a warm invitation, assuring you that he will receive you if you will turn to him. Let me encourage you with what we saw in Ezekiel 18. We saw that our gracious God is ready to welcome us. We saw him pleading with you to repent. We saw him declaring that he will gladly receive you if you return to him. Hear again the words of Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, starting in the middle of verse 30. Repent and turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. He says, get a new heart and a new spirit. You say, how can I do that? This warm invitation, coupled with the knowledge that repentance is a saving grace, provides hope to sinners. The invitation assures us that God is able to change us. He's the one that does the change. The declaration that we are all too hardened in our sin to to respond to Him in an odd way gives us hope. How could that give us hope? We're too hardened to turn to Him? That gives us hope? Yes, Because people do turn to him. How do they turn to him? Because of his grace. Because he changes people. Because we see see, people do come. It's possible for them to do what is impossible for them to do. Because God does it. God is the one who can give you a new heart. He promises that in the new covenant. As pointed out last week, that gives hope to the most desperate heart. A person that says, I, 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 I'm so corrupt, I could, never, I could never be accepted by God. I could never turn to God. And, and we say, that's right. I've got good news for you. You're worse than you think you are. You can absolutely never do that. But God can change you. The doctrine of total inability also is able to humble the proudest heart. Because it shows that proud heart that it can't just come to God if it wants to. It's too corrupt, it's too ruined and hardened in sin. The one, maybe the Pharisee that's all proud, you're too hard to come to God. No, I I come to God whenever I, no, you don't. What else can we do but come to Christ with absolute dependence and thanksgiving when we realize that it's His work? We fall on Christ. We we plead to His mercy, like the the tax collector that went into the temple to pray when the Pharisee went up. The tax collector beat on his chest and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. All he did is present himself to God as a sinner and fall on God's mercy. And he went down to his house justified. What else can we do? We can be certain that we will be warmly welcomed by God because we come to him in Christ, our excellent Savior. And if, unless God can turn Christ away, he can't turn us away if we, we come leaning on Christ. We can only be rejected if we are leaning on 
him and he is rejected. You, you can't be rejected, in other words. It can never be that God would reject his son. So we come, present our case to him, we fall upon him, and he delivers us from our bondage to, and our love of sin to come and be God's people and to serve him forever. Please stand and let's pray. Oh Lord God, we give you thanks for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that in your covenant, that in a, it's kind of in an odd way, that you tell your people that you will write their, your law on their heart so that they will delight in your ways. They will want to come to you. They will want to live for you. They'll want to turn from sin and come to be your people and present themselves to you as servants to obey you and to, to have you as their God. And Lord, this is a remarkable thing that you should tell us that in the promises of the covenant. You also tell us that you will remember our iniquity no more, that you will forgive our sin and remember our iniquity no more. And those are both such wonderful promises. The one of those promises we, we receive by faith and the other one we receive by repentance, by just by turning to you, Lord, coming to you and falling upon Christ to, to save us, to have mercy upon us. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause us to do that, to be sure that we have done that. And we pray that we would find the joy and the peace that comes from having repented of our sin and turned to our God. Father, we pray that you would continue the work that you have begun in us. We know that repentance, though it is a one-time thing at conversion, it is also an ongoing thing because there is still sin in our life that has not yet been manifested to us. There is still sin that we will commit, that we need to repent of, and you give us new repentance and new obedience day by day by day. Lord, may you keep on working in us. May you do the work that you have promised to do, and may we bring forth much fruit. We pray, Lord, that we would have a deeper repentance as we grow in your grace and that we would turn more and more to you, O Lord. We thank you that the day will come when we will be like Christ and we will be fully yours and there will be no more half measures. Father, make, it, make, our, our, make that saving work in us complete, we pray. Thank you that Jesus has done all that is required and that we have hope in him and not in ourselves. If it was in ourselves, we would despair. But because it is in him, we hope. Father, bless your people, Lord, and strengthen them in these things, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.